England in 1944, you know this as the Flying Gasworks. In the rest of Britain, it was known as V2. But in Germany, the land of its birth, it was called the A4 rocket. And on the evening of the 8th of September, 1944, the first A4 landed in London. More than a thousand rockets were aimed at London, and most of them were launched from The Hague in Holland. Not far from the historic Palace of Peace, right in the centre of The Hague, was an ordinary city street. This street was cleared of traffic and pedestrians for a couple of hours, and then a rocket was ready for launching. This is an actual launching site used by the Germans. You will see how little special preparation they required for firing a rocket. They wanted protection from the RAF and from the wind. The rocket was always placed on a launching table. In this case, in the middle of the avenue of trees. These trees are just about the same height as a rocket on a launching table, so conditions were pretty good. This should prove to you that a rocket can be launched from almost anywhere. An area 23 feet square is sufficient, provided it can be approached by vehicles. The Germans fired from town or country. Along this avenue, there were nine separate launching sites. A wood is the ideal site for rocket launching, as long as you can get in and out of it easily. Aiming marks were painted on trees, and a pit was dug for the firing control vehicle. The firing troop commander was in this vehicle, about 30 yards away from the actual launching site. In a wood, the ground has to be levelled, and you must put down a firm base to support the launching table and the rocket. The Germans used wood or steel sleepers to provide this base. The Germans fired their last rocket against Britain in March 1945, and we took over after that. We collected damaged rockets from all over Germany and decided that the German scientists and technicians would fire some more rockets, but this time under British control. Much of the rocket equipment had been blown up by the retreating Germans. We had to reassemble it, find out how it worked, and make new equipment for ourselves. A thing like this had to be turned into a workable launching table. We reconstructed equipment, we made new vehicles, and we finished by making complete rockets from captured equipment. Sometimes luck was on our side, as when we found a factory in the British zone which was producing road transporters for the local farmers. These road transporters, known as Wiedelwagens to the Germans, are used for carrying the rocket. So the factory started to make them for us. Among the vehicles we reconstructed was this one used by the Germans to convey liquid oxygen from the railhead to the launching site. At Cuxhaven, we took over a gun-testing range and put up some new buildings, such as this proofing tower, where the rocket stood while undergoing some of its tests. Very soon, we had our own repair plants at work, where we assembled rockets from captured German equipment. Besides shelters for rocket parts, we built workshops, sheds, and stores. We captured a large number of German components, aluminium tanks for alcohol and liquid oxygen, and cylindrical drums containing rocket warheads. The tanks for holding alcohol and liquid oxygen are extremely light, although they're so large. The capacity of one of these tanks is approximately four and a half tons of liquid oxygen. Yet four men can carry an empty oxygen tank without any difficulty. The mechanism of the rocket is best studied in diagram. The rocket is driven by the reaction of a jet of high-speed gases. This jet of gases is produced in the venturi or combustion chamber in the rocket by the combustion of alcohol and liquid oxygen. Here is an actual combustion chamber. It is made of steel. 
The pressure in the Venturi is very high during burning and to force the fuels in, the rocket has two pumps, one for each fuel. These pumps are driven by a turbine placed between them. This turbine develops 600 horsepower since eight and a half tons of fuel have to be pumped into the combustion chamber in the space of 60 seconds. Here is the complete unit, turbine and two pumps. The turbine is driven by steam, which is produced by the chemical reaction between hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate, contained in these two tanks. Forward of the tail unit are the two fuel tanks. First, the liquid oxygen tank, then the alcohol tank. Here they are during the assembly of an actual rocket. Owing to the shape of the rocket, the alcohol delivery pipe has to pass through the center of the liquid oxygen tank. Finally, in the front of the rocket, we have the control compartment and the warhead. In the control compartment are two gyroscopes. These gyroscopes are the brains of the rocket. They are in universal mountings. Electrical pickups measure the movements of the gyroscope and translate these movements to the carbon veins and the trimmers in the tail unit. These veins and trimmers direct the rocket, both in bearing and elevation, along its trajectory and prevent any deviation from its planned course. The four veins are in the jet of the rocket and there is a trimmer on each of the four fins. This mock-up represents the inside of the control compartment in the rocket. In the background is a skeleton tail unit with the vanes and trimmers in position. As the control compartment moves, the gyroscopes move in their mountings and these movements are conveyed through electric cables in the rocket to corresponding servo motors in the tail unit. There is a servo motor for each carbon vein and trimmer. The servo motors move the vanes and the trimmers to counteract the original movement of the control compartment and to keep the rocket on its course. This gyroscope controls the elevation of the rocket by moving a pair of the carbon vanes, thus turning the rocket from the vertical over to an angle of 43 degrees. The other gyroscope controls the direction of the rocket by the movement of this pair of vanes. These four vanes, made of carbon to resist the heat, are situated in the jet and they can control the rocket only while the jet is burning. This period of control lasts for 60 to 70 seconds and covers the first 20 miles of the trajectory up to the all burnt position. When it has reached the all burnt position, the rocket is a free projectile just like any artillery shell after it has left the muzzle of the gun. This is what actually happened when the Germans fired on London from The Hague. The distance is nearly 200 miles, the maximum range of the A4. The rocket was controlled for the first 20 miles of its flight, or until the jet had stopped burning. At this point, its velocity is 6,500 feet per second, and it is at 43 degrees angle of elevation. It keeps on climbing, until it has reached a height of 50 miles, which is halfway on its journey. Then, still travelling towards London, it starts to fall. But it is slowed up to a velocity of 4,000 feet per second by the resistance of the air. It actually strikes the target at 4,000 feet per second, or nearly 3,000 miles an hour. The whole journey takes only five minutes. By comparison, a 16-inch gun will fire a one-ton shell about 25 miles. The highest altitude that man has yet reached is about 12 and a half miles, accomplished by two Americans in 1933. In the workshop which we built at Cuxhaven, German technicians and engineers under British supervision built rockets from the parts we had collected. Here are A4 rockets in various stages of construction. 
First of all, there are the two fuel tanks. One for liquid oxygen and one for alcohol. They're in a half shell padded with glass wool. This rocket has the motor attached to the tank compartment, which is now complete. The other half shell has been added. But the control compartment is not on the rocket yet. Now we see a tail unit ready to be added to the rocket. Wiring is being connected so that the rocket can be tested for electrical continuity. The control compartment has been fitted to this rocket. There's a complete rocket. It was painted black and white so that we could see it more easily when it was fired. Now the rocket, to be tested, is connected to a compressed air line. The tanks and pipes are tested for leaks by air pressure and at the same time all the electrical circuits are checked for continuity. When the tests are completed, the tail unit is added to the rocket. At the other end, the warhead is secured. This wasn't the normal German practice at this stage, but we wanted the warhead on the rocket so that we could lift it into the proofing tower. Then the rocket was lifted from the assembly line onto a transporter. It was then taken to the proofing tower so that the control apparatus could be adjusted. The rocket was placed in the vertical or launching position in the proofing tower. The gyroscopes and the control units were inserted and the steering tests were done. To do this, the axes of the gyroscopes were lined up with the axis of the rocket. When the tests were completed, the rocket was ready for firing. We transferred it directly onto an elevator transporter known as the Meilerwagen to the Germans. When this stage was reached in wartime, the Germans used what they called the hot cakes method. They put the newly tested rockets onto a train and sent them straight to the railhead in the firing area. The Germans almost always fired a rocket within three days of its production because they found that the number of failures was seriously increased by long storage. Now we are going to follow the operational procedure used by the Germans, starting at the railhead. At the railhead, the rockets were taken over by the technical troop of the rocket regiment. The German railway wagons were not long enough to carry a rocket, so the system was to load two rockets onto three railway wagons. The rockets were loaded without the warheads, which were carried separately in the middle wagon. The first job the technical troop had to tackle was the lifting of the rocket from the railway wagon to the road transporter. A mobile crane is used to lift the A4. The railway wagon is pulled out from underneath the rocket, and then the road transporter is pulled into position. The crane swings the rocket across and lowers it onto the road transporter. The road rockets to the field store of the technical troop. This was naturally selected for concealment and for its handiness to the firing sites. The railway engine shunts the wagons to bring the second rocket under the mobile crane, and the technical troop carried out the shifting process in the same way as before. In the German setup, there was one technical troop to three firing troops. Here you can see that the railway engine has brought the second rocket into position under the mobile crane just as the first rocket leaves on a road transporter for the technical troops field store. When the rockets arrived at the field store, the technical troops first job 
was to fix the warheads on the new rockets. The warheads were delivered in their cylindrical transit drums. First of all, the transit drum is lifted by a small crane. The rocket warhead weighs about a ton and it contains about 1,700 pounds of explosive. The drum is supported at the front while the warhead is screwed onto the control compartment. When the warhead has been fixed to the rocket, a man removes the securing bolt which attached the warhead to its transit drum. And then the drum is slid off. Once the warheads were fixed on the rockets, the technical troop's next job was to carry out electrical tests, make minor repairs and hand over a 100% rocket to the firing troop. They used the mobile crane a great deal in this work, particularly in the transferring of the rocket from the road transporter to the Myla wagon. Each technical troop had only one mobile crane on its war establishment, so that after use of the railhead, the crane had to be towed to the rocket store and set up there. The mobile crane was not specially designed for rocket work. It was a standard piece of German equipment, capable of lifting 10 tons, which is considerably more than the weight of the rocket before it's fueled. The crane could be towed behind an ordinary vehicle. A well-trained team could erect or dismantle the crane in about half an hour. Besides the testing and the delivery of the rockets, the technical troop were responsible for the transfer of fuel from rail tankers to road tankers. This transfer was done by a small petrol-driven pump fitted to the side of the railway wagon. The liquid oxygen was always brought to the firing area by rail. The actual transfer of the fuel was delayed to the last possible moment to avoid losses by evaporation. The fueling troop's road tanker holds only six and a half tons of liquid oxygen, enough for one rocket while the rail tanker contains 30 tons. Not only that, but the road tanker loses 3% of its contents by evaporation every day. The long pipe is put on to act as an outlet. When firing was ordered, the firing troop sent their Myler wagon to the technical troops field store to collect a rocket. This meant that members of the technical troop had to transfer the rocket from the road transporter to the firing troops Myler wagon. The transfer of rockets from technical troop to the firing troop could be done anywhere. It was not limited to the field store. In fact, the rocket was often transferred some distance away so that the storage site remained concealed, especially from the air. Before the transfer took place, the rocket was completed. The warhead had been fitted and the electrical tests were satisfactory. The rocket on its road transporter is towed under one side of the crane. The firing troop tows their Myla wagon under the other side of the crane. Then the rocket is lifted from the road transporter and transferred over to the Myla wagon. The Myla wagon supports the rocket in two places, with a clamp between the tank section and the tail unit of the rocket, and a clamp at the nose. The technical group lowers the rocket into the two clamps. The forward clamp, which grips the warhead, is tightened up by a ratchet.
Then the main clamp is screwed up. The lifting tackle is removed from the rocket. Now the empty road transporter is towed away. The firing troop takes over the Mylewagen again. This elevator transporter is designed to have as much manoeuvrability as possible, and it can be towed at either end. The firing troop connects the Mylewagen to its towing vehicle and takes the rocket off to the launching site. Meanwhile, the rest of the technical troop are completing the fuel transfer. The pipes connecting the pump to each of the oxygen tankers soon become covered in frost and snow because the liquid oxygen is so cold. That white vapour is not, of course, oxygen vapour, but water vapour condensed by the liquid oxygen. When the road tanker is full, the inlet valve is screwed down. The men wear special gloves to protect their hands against the cold. Now the technical troops' work is finished. By this time, the firing troop were working on the launching site. Once it was prepared, the first step was to tow the launching table onto the site. The requirements of a launching site are extremely simple. You need enough room to manoeuvre your fueling and firing vehicles, and a hard base for the launching table. At Cookshaven, we had no operational problems, so we were able to build a concrete surface. If you remember the actual German sites we showed you, you'll realise that an improvised surface is just as effective as a specially prepared one. Now the firing troop screwed down the legs of the launching table in order that these legs could take the weight of the platform. This was done so that the towing dolly could be removed. The launching table is placed over a surveyed mark on the launching site. This is done so that the rocket can be accurately orientated later on. The towing dolly was pulled out and wheeled away. The launching table has an adjustable jack on each leg so that the platform can be levelled. There's a turntable on the top for turning the rocket when it's standing on the platform. The launching table is made of welded steel and weighs 3,600 pounds. Between the legs of the platform there is a flame deflector which splits the jet. The firing troop brought the rocket to the launching site on their Mylewagen. They tow the rocket towards the launching table, but remove the towing vehicles while the Mylewagen is still about 30 feet away from the table. In order to carry out adjustments and tests, when the rocket is in the vertical position, a cradle is put on the nose. This cradle is held in position until the rocket is erected by the front clamp of the Mylewagen. The Germans move the Mylewagen to the launching table by means of a winch. They can't use the towing vehicle to pull it, since the launching table is in the way, so they chose this winching method. The Mylewagen is steered by hand into an exact position by the launching table. Once it is pulled right up to the table, the supporting jacks on the Mylewagen are screwed down. Now the Mylewagen is able to erect the rocket on the launching table. Although fueling would be easier with the rocket in the horizontal position, this wasn't done because of the light construction of the fuel tanks. These tanks are designed to stand the weight of the fuel only when the rocket is in the vertical position. In the horizontal position, the tanks would collapse. When the rocket is empty, it weighs four tons, including the warhead. But when it has been fueled, it weighs about twelve and a half tons.
The Mylovagen arm is elevated by two hydraulic rams. The pressure for operating these rams is supplied by a small gasoline engine. This man is in control of the operation. The elevating arm of the Mylovagen holds the rocket an inch or two above the launching table. Then the legs of the launching table are screwed up so that the table can take the weight of the rocket. The clamps on the Mylovagen are released so that the rocket is standing without support on the launching table. The elevating arm of the Mylovagen is lowered about 10 degrees. Then the jacks supporting the Mylovagen are removed. This enables the Mylovagen to be manhandled 90 centimetres, or about a yard, away from the launching table. Then the testing platforms can be fitted to the Mylovagen at various heights. Meanwhile, the fueling troop were bringing up their fuel train. The train consisted of a towed alcohol bowser, a self-propelled alcohol bowser towing a trailer pump, Then the towed liquid oxygen vehicle. And finally, the Bowser for T-Stoff or hydrogen peroxide. The fueling vehicles were concealed near the launching site until needed. At the launching site, the survey party now leveled the rocket. This was an initial leveling process to be checked at a later stage. The leveling was done by adjusting the legs of the launching table. The technicians of the firing troop remove the jet covers from the Venturi. They also bolt the carbon vanes into position. These vanes were not put on earlier because they are easily broken. The air-operated valves in the fuel supply system are tested by using a mobile air compressor. This compressor is also used to fill compressed air bottles in the rocket. Paper covers, rather like paper drinking cups, are put over the oxygen jets. This is to make sure that the oxygen does not cause mechanical damage to the jets. When the preliminary tests were completed, the alcohol vehicles were called from their temporary parking place. Alcohol was always the first fuel to be filled in the rocket. The rocket is fired electrically from a control panel in a special vehicle. The electrical cables connecting the control panel to the rocket are supported on a long pole attached to the launching table. During the tests on the rocket, the batteries become exhausted so they have to be replaced. When the alcohol fueling vehicles arrived, they parked along one side of the Mylovagen. The outlet of the alcohol pump was connected to one of two permanent delivery pipes fitted to the elevating arm of the Mylovagen. This delivery pipe extended the whole length of the Mylovagen arm and the alcohol was fed in through the control compartment to the top of the alcohol tank. Now the alcohol filling started. It took about 10 minutes to fill the alcohol tank in the rocket. The liquid oxygen trailer was the next fueling vehicle to arrive at the launching site. The Germans always tried to fuel the liquid oxygen within an hour of the time of firing the rocket to avoid freezing up the valves. This arrangement of fueling vehicles round the Mylovagen was a typical German layout. As well as the alcohol and oxygen vehicles on either side, the t stoff vehicle is directly in front of the rocket. The liquid oxygen is fed in at the middle of the rocket. The pump is connected to the permanent delivery pipe on the arm of the Mylovagen. The sodium permanganate is the last fuel to go into the rocket and at this stage it is placed in an electric heater to warm it up. The reaction between hydrogen peroxide and sodium permanganate, which produces the steam for the rocket turbine, is quickened if the sodium permanganate is warm. By now the oxygen fueling is in full swing. 
and the pipes through which the liquid oxygen is travelling begin to show the characteristic formation of ice and snow. The oxygen fueling took about eight minutes to complete. Now that the alcohol fueling of the rocket was finished, the pump was disconnected and the alcohol bowsers began to move off. During the oxygen fueling, the hydrogen peroxide is pumped into the steam unit. It is first pumped into a measuring tank fixed halfway up on the arm of the Mylovagen. From this point, a measured quantity of hydrogen peroxide is run into the tank inside the rocket. Hydrogen peroxide is a corrosive fluid. The men who handled it wore rubber gloves and the connecting joints of the pipes which carried the fluid were placed in buckets of water. Every now and then the sodium permanganate, the other element used in producing the steam, was taken out of its electrical heater and shaken to mix it up and make it more effective. As the fuel tanks are filled, the weight of the rocket increases and the joint between the tank section and the tail unit needs retightening. An elevating ladder is used to get a member of the firing troop up to the joint. There is a danger that the coldness of the liquid oxygen might freeze up the rest of the machinery. So, to make certain this didn't happen, hot air was blown up through the rocket from an air blower. The Germans did this only if there was a hitch in the preparation and the rocket could not be fired within an hour of the oxygen fueling. As the job of each fueling vehicle was finished, it was driven away from the launching site. The oxygen fueling is almost completed and clouds of condensed water vapour are pouring out. When the liquid oxygen tank has been filled, the connecting pipes are removed with the aid of a hammer. Once again, special gloves are worn for the operation. Just as the liquid oxygen fueling is finished, it is time to start the Z-Stoff fueling. The sodium permanganate is removed from the electrical heater and taken to the rocket. Now the sodium permanganate is lifted up the side and tipped into the tank through an opening in the tail unit. Next, the igniter is prepared. The wooden framework, which is fixed inside the venturi and supports the igniter, is put together. The igniter works like a large-sized catherine wheel and is started electrically. Now that the fueling is finished, the arm of the mylovagen is lowered. The rocket is finally levelled and orientated in the direction of the line of fire. This is done by using a dial sight on the launching table, having as a reference a collimator set up over a trig point a few yards away. The trig point was established by preliminary survey. The igniter is placed in the venturi and connected up. Then the firing troop take cover in the slit trenches they've dug near the rocket.
the troop commander goes to the firing control vehicle. The control panel from which the rocket is fired is in this vehicle. The final steering tests are made. And then the firing troop commander gives his orders. The steering clear is clear. The streetwork clear is clear. Schlüssel aufschießen. Schlüssel steht aufschießen. Durchschalten. Ist durchgeschaltet. Belüftung klar, Zündung klar, Vorstufe klar. it reaches an altitude of 40 to 50,000 feet, a vapor trail condenses in its wake, just like the trail made by high-flying aircraft. The effect of the rocket going down is an optical illusion caused by the angle of the camera which shot this scene. The rocket's still going up all right. Now we see the operation in slow motion. When the troop commander says, draw Schalten, the igniter is lit and the alcohol and liquid oxygen, which are flowing under gravity, are ignited. This gives a thrust of eight tons, which of course won't lift a 12-ton rocket. The troop commander looks at the flame to see that it is burning evenly. When he sees that it is, he gives the command, Hauptstufe. This starts the pumps. The thrust from the jet increases rapidly up to 25 tons. The control cables are ejected electromagnetically and the rocket takes off. This is a close-up in slow motion of the rocket leaving the launching table. This was the first operational model of a new conception. Complicated to produce and not very accurate or reliable in action. But it was extremely difficult to counter. And to the Germans, its range of 200 miles was only a beginning they were already thinking of a rocket that would cross the Atlantic and could be guided to a controlled landing by a pilot in a pressurized cabin. We cannot afford to be complacent about the rocket and its potentialities in the future. The record of this film is a warning that we've got a lot to think about. <laughs>